Ready to go, please. We are ready to go, please. Hello right. uh, and welcome to this event on the eve of the Eastern Partnership Summit, looking at the future of the partnership, its priorities and ways to succeed. The event today is organized by member of the European Parliament, Petras Ostrovicius, with the support of Renew Group at the European Parliament. My name is Iskra Kirova. I'm the senior analyst at the Open Society European Policy Institute, working on the Eastern Partnership region, and I'll be the moderator for uh, today's discussion. A few housekeeping rules before we begin. The event is on the record. It will be streamed live on Facebook. A recording will also later be available on YouTube. We have a busy program with several segments and many speakers. Questions can be asked to the speakers in the chat. If you'd like to identify yourself and your affiliation as you ask a question, that is very welcome. I encourage our audience to post questions to the speakers throughout the event. We will be monitoring consistently the chat and we will try to put uh, the questions to our speakers as we go along, not just in the final Q&A segment. And with that, I'd like to turn to the substance of today's discussion. The Eastern Partnership Summit next week uh, is taking place at a critical time. Virtually all of the Eastern Partnership countries are facing serious challenges, whether security and stability ones, or rule of law and good governance ones, or um, existential threats to human life, rights and dignity. The messages that the EU will send on the 15th of December couldn't be more important in this time of upheaval for the region. So without any further ado from my side, I'd like to give the floor to our host today, Member of the European Parliament, Mr. Petras Ostrovicius, to set the scene of our discussion, set out the stakes for the EU and the Eastern Partnership countries as they meet next week. Uh, Petras Ostrovicius has for a long time advanced the Eastern Partnership agenda in the European Parliament. He was the rapporteur for the Eastern Partnership when uh, the uh, recommendations of the Parliament were being prepared last year in the run-up to the June 2020 summit. He is the AFED standing rapporteur on Belarus. He was rapporteur on Moldova and has held many other positions for the region. Petras, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Iska. Good day to everybody, uh, friends, uh, colleagues, and uh, ladies and gentlemen. Indeed, my pleasure uh, to um, make some introductory remarks um, uh, before we start uh, this online events in uh, awaiting for 2021 uh, Eastern Partnership Summit. Well, I have to admit uh, that uh, I'm, uh, well, partly happy with the uh, achievements uh, we we have uh, concerning the Eastern Partnership uh, Initiative as such. I mean, if to look back uh, um, from 2008, I mean, when uh, the Eastern Partnership Initiative have started uh, its uh, political life, I think there are things uh, with what we should be really happy and, um, you know, uh, having a kind of good basis for analysis. But again, uh, we shouldn't be, I mean, just looking uh, backwards. Uh, we have to look uh, forward. Uh, what should be done more to enhance, to strengthen, and to bring more cooperation between the European Union and Eastern Partnership countries, especially those who have expressed their willingness uh, to uh, sooner or later to join the European Union. And this message should be equally and well understood on both sides of this process, from Eastern Partnership countries as well as the European Union countries. Well, if, if to look uh, back uh, uh, as to uh, some things uh, which have involved, uh, you know, I mean, there is one critical remark which I still have to, to repeat myself. Looking at the results or uh, meetings with the Europe, uh, of European Union uh, as well as the single uh, member states of the Eastern Partnership, especially those with the having associated uh, partnership status. I still have to uh, remind you that uh, the European Union still speaks uh, as um, acknowledging 
some single countries' uh, European aspirations and European choice, um, but not uh, committing themselves as uh, they really respect this European uh, aspiration uh, in, in a daily cooperation. Uh, I think this is a, a kind of a bit missing political uh, link and signal from the EU side that we fully um, embrace uh, the European aspirations of the associated countries. We respect and we try to do at most in order to, you know, enhance this aspiration and to translate this inspiration into our practical policies. On the uh, Eastern Partnership country side, we always talk about diversification. And uh, in our latest um, uh, report from 2020, uh, we made it very clear that uh, we've been willing I mean, to repeat more for more rather than less for less. I mean, less for less, to my mind, uh, doesn't work uh, anymore. I mean, those who want uh, to have less for less, uh, I don't see really many countries probably except uh, Lukashenko, but he is not counted uh, in this regard. So more for more did a very good job. And uh, I think we, we got uh, a very speedy process of diversification in, uh, in, among the Eastern Partnership countries. At certain point, I'm even worried about this kind of diversification tendency. Um, if to look uh, at the differences which are be uh, between the associated countries and non-associated countries, we see quite a space quite a space, and, and I see that space increasing. So diversification worked. It should work even among the associated countries. But, uh, you know, uh, um, I don't know, I mean, to what extent uh, it should be promoted anymore. I think it, it, it goes in a such, such a natural way by political choice and by uh, existing possibilities and uh, enforced um, uh, cooperation uh, practices that uh, it goes in a very... Uh, uh, natural way. And um, if to start uh, from our political cooperation, as I said, uh, I still miss political commitment, uh, really comprehensively uh, framed political uh, commitment from the EU side. We're too slow, probably, to, uh, on the EU side to pick up uh, this kind of strategic interest of uh, those uh, associated countries. We don't repeat it uh, too often. Uh, we are too decent, I mean, to, uh, to quote uh, uh, European aspirations uh, in, um, among ourselves. Although, uh, I have to admit uh, that even in the European Parliament, we have a real, really group of dedicated uh, and very well involved, uh, I would call political godmothers and godfathers of, uh, of the Eastern Partnership uh, policy line. And I'm, uh, I'm sure, I mean, we will keep this group uh, really working uh, hard on uh, further uh, next, uh, let's say, decade of uh, Eastern Partnership cooperation. But um, we have to do something more in this regard. And it's not necessarily about the all member states. Uh, I think uh, there is uh, still a huge um, uh, difference in understanding between the member states on the Eastern Partnership uh, uh, strategy as such. Secondly, on economic cooperation. Here I see a good tendency, and uh, uh, even the latest documents of the European Union uh, confirm a process of gradual integration into the single market. To my mind, this is a strategic line we have to keep as much as possible, and especially in, um, uh, in transforming it in, uh, it in sectorial policies. It will open a lot of new possibilities for Eastern Partnership countries, because if we speak about the in a single market. So we have to be very consistent in understanding of the single market. To my mind, it, uh, it takes uh, even a, a labor market as well. And having the labor market being open for Eastern partnership countries, it will contribute uh, greatly to both sides uh, because the European U Union needs labor force and uh, um, indeed uh, uh, very uh, well-educated labor force um, um, competitive labor force, but uh, as well as Eastern Partnership countries. I mean, looking at the example of uh, us, I, I have to repeat, this is a, uh, such a factor for economic cooperation, which sooner or later comes back to the, uh, to the countries and contributes to the domestic economic growth. So with this uh, 
in mind, I think we, we have to keep this economic, uh, gradual economic integration, speaking about the common economic space uh, more and more. And, and indeed, we need a clear program in this regard. It's not just um, uh, kind of uh, full implementation of association uh, agreement. Uh, I think we, we have to be a bit more ambitious and I call on EU institutions, I mean, to come up with the kind of uh, very timely response in this regard and have, uh, uh, um, and have this uh, common economic space uh, uh, um, idea translated into a, a very comprehensive document. And finally, uh, Iskra, I, I want to touch upon uh, um, security concerns. Um, in spite of all uh, uh, our good efforts, uh, um, Eastern, partnership country, uh, Eastern partnership countries and strategy, strategy as such is still seen by Russia in particular as a geopolitical challenge. And I'm sure it will remain. I don't see any uh, positive change in this regard from the uh, Russian side. And they will do everything possible to burden those countries, especially Ukraine, uh, as well as Georgia and Moldova, with uh, existing and new uh, kind of uh, uh, factors of uh, security, um, multi-layer uh, multi uh, activities uh, working against those countries' interests. So we have to be very serious in understanding the situation. So that's why uh, the European Union should remain strongly for those countries' sovereignty, territorial integrity, as well as doing everything possible using new instruments like European Peace Facility, for example, as it was recently um, first uh, decisions made towards three countries to employ more and more uh, common security and defense instruments in order to support those countries on their way to uh, protect uh, them and to bring more security in this regard. I'm particularly happy that the Belarus op uh, Democratic Opposition will be invited to the uh, Eastern Partnership Summit. This is such a pleasure to see, again, um, absolutely different people with a different perspective for their country as Belarus uh, being among us. I think we missed too much uh, and we've been probably too uh, idealistic um, uh, trying to invite uh, Lukashenko uh, in one way or another uh, at different periods of time. I never had any idea uh, positive idea about Lukashenko. So it proved to be as uh, um, as my uh, worst scenario case. But nevertheless, um, Belarusian opposition uh, representative most welcome to join us and to speak about uh, our, I guess, um, uh, common future in this regard as well. And very finally, uh, I'm very happy that the Eastern Partnership uh, Initiative um, uh, initiative invited. Uh, very vibrant uh, civic society in those countries to take part in different projects and in uh, uh, outlining different strategies for their countries. This is such a strength which we have to use in full extent and uh, to work uh, with the governments of those countries, but as well as with the civic, uh, civic society from which we receive very timely and sometimes critically correct uh, uh, messages uh, which are so useful uh, for us uh, to, to work further on. Uh, so with this in mind, uh, I thank you all, Iskra, uh, you uh, for taking this uh, uh, moderator uh, role um, during our event. I'm looking forward for great ideas and a very fruitful exchange on our today's online debate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Petras, and thank you really for capturing the many facets of the current dynamics uh, in the region. I won't attempt to summarize. You've already raised a number of important questions that I've, in, I've noted down and we'll come back to uh, later in the discussion. Uh, but now we turn to uh, Mr. Lawrence Meredith, who is the Director for Neighborhood East and Institution Building at the European Commission's uh, Directorate for uh, Enlargement, Negotiations and Neighborhood Policy. Mr. Meredith, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and thanks to Petrus for organizing this very important exchange um, uh, just on the eve of what is a, an extremely important summit. Um, the first time we will have been able to bring people together at leaders level for four years. I think it's a, a, 
despite uh, the growing difficulties surrounding the COVID situation right now, we are still uh, cautiously optimistic that this can go ahead uh, as planned in person in a restricted format, which I think uh, we all feel because we had last year the leaders virtual conference in June. I think it's so important that there is the opportunity to have a discussion in person. And we, we very much hope that this will, will now proceed. Um, I'd like to start by saying um, that throughout this dreadful COVID pandemic, uh, I think the European Union has risen to the challenge and shown that we are the closest partner of the Eastern Partnership, um, firstly through um, massively reprogramming over a billion euros of support uh, last spring already, 18 months ago, almost two years ago, um, which we're, of course, now implementing at full speed. Um, but also, in the case of vaccinations, we've offered, um, with, together as Team Europe with the member states, 13 million uh, supplies of vaccinations, which is so important at this stage of the um, pandemic for ordinary citizens across the Eastern Partnership to have um, the simple security and safety that is necessary to, to be part of what the slogan of the the. the the, the summit is really targeted to our times, and that's number one, recovery, and that's both on the level of the health and economy. Uh, number two, um, <clears throat> resilience. I think, uh, and, and Petrus is very uh, eloquent on the subject of resilience. We really need to define what we mean, and I'm sure other speakers will come in on this, uh, but it's a very broad and important uh, context, uh, context that includes um, of obviously the health systems, which have taken a shock, not just in the Eastern Partnership, but globally, including in the European Union, but also how you mitigate the socioeconomic impact requires really resilient uh, uh, economies. Um, and we do see them bouncing back faster than I think people predicted at the beginning of the pandemic. They took a big hit to, get, to take one example, you know, between five to 10% contraction of the economy, which is actually massive. Um, I think the challenge will to be to ensure that recovery is with jobs, because I think getting growth back is only part of the story. Um, and thirdly, and this is really important, reform, uh, because we also see threats to institutions, threats to human rights, um, because you know we're all in this virtual world, which on the positive side is allowing us to have this conversation. But on the other hand, um, we, we do see growing challenges, cybersecurity, um, so I think the resilience of institutions, the fundaments of democracy and rule of law uh, need to be strengthened. And that brings me uh, to the summit. I think uh, there is a really uh, strong agenda uh, and let's talk about it. I think there are two key pillars. I talked about reform. So the governance pillar is essential. It's uh, People are looking, citizens, civil society are looking for strong commitments from leaders of the Eastern Partnership together with the European Union to make ambitious commitments on judicial reform, tackling corruption and organised crime um, and public administration reform, giving citizens the safety, security and services that they require. I think that's so important. And doing so in an inclusive way, which involves um, civil society, also the business community, the youth, I think this inclusive approach to democracy and engages the regions a particular priority because uh, over two thirds of the Eastern Partnership population lives outside the capitals and they have, they're have five to 10 times poorer than uh, those living in capitals. I think that's fundamentally important. Of course, uh, the second pillar is investment. And we have a very ambitious economic and investment plan where we will be putting in 2.3 billion euros of European Union public money. We estimate that we can leverage around 17 billion euros. These are huge figures. But what it really means is delivering services for citizens that they need. And I think I expect consensus on uh, the proposal set out almost two years ago on the future of the Eastern Partnership following very extensive consultations with civil society, both from the Eastern Partnership and the European Union. Um, on the five priorities of number one, economy with connectivity, number two and three, the green and digital transition, which is so fundamental for building back better, and uh, fourth and fifth, back to these key issues of 
Four is justice and home affairs and security, let's say the hard elements of the governance pillar. And the softer, the democracy, independent media, civil society, engagement of youth and regional actors, and building more inclusive societies. So this is so important. And please note that we, we took on board the feedback we got in our consultation um, in 2019 the 10 year anniversary, which said we need more on the governance and reform side. That's why we now have two pillars um, and that allows us to go even deeper into these fundamental issues. The last point I want to make is, I think it's so important, and Petra said this very clearly, that there's a, a strong and encouraging message of the engagement of the European Union with the Eastern Partnership, and that there's effective communication and um, uh, all the teams, my team and all the other teams of the European Commission and the European External Action Service are deeply engaged now in preparing that summit and making sure we have the best possible communication tools. But it doesn't stop on the 15th of December. It starts on the 15th of December. Once we have the leaders' declaration, we want to go out and take that message to the regions and really get out there and communicate the importance, as Petrus has said, of engagement with our Eastern partners. Uh, this is a common European space. Uh, it's a common economic space, and it needs to be a common space for governance as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Meredith. And now we have just a little bit of time. I know you have to leave soon. Uh, just a couple of questions from my side, and then I also would like to hand over to Petras for any reactions uh, from his side. One question on the rule of law and good governance. As you indeed mentioned, this was a, a key issue that was highlighted in the consultations in 2019 and in the joint communication then. It's also present now in the post-2020 agenda. Um, however, um, among civil society, uh, there is a, a sense that we could still do more, uh, that we are lacking a dedicated rule of law and governance mechanism for the region, something drawing on the EU rich experience, uh, both internally, but also in the Western Balkans. Do you, uh, how does the Commission and the EU currently reflect on that? How would you elaborate? Uh, how does the post 2020 uh, agenda address this issue? Do you think that this is sufficient? And what can we expect a little bit uh, in a little bit more detail? Um, and another question we have, uh, and that is specifically on the issue of security, um, about the role of EU CSDP missions in the region. This has come through our audience. If you could uh, each maybe uh, comment briefly on that. Thank you very much. We will first have a reaction from Petras, and then we go back to Mr. Meredith. Thank you, Iska. I will be very short uh, on, uh, on this rule of law. You know, I, I would take this decision, um, uh, the latest um, kind of uh, verdict of the European Union uh, Court of Justice on uh, rule of law conditionality. Uh, of course, it applies I mean, to member states, at least to some member states, uh, Hungary and Poland. But uh, I wouldn't be so, you know, um, uh, narrowing uh, this approach just to the member states. I think we have to expand this explanation towards Eastern Partnership countries as well, because rule of law, uh, fundamental rights, uh, uh, um, in inclusive society, as uh, Lawrence rightly said, remains key factors, key values, uh, which uh, on which we, we, we shouldn't close any, any uh, uh, time, um, our eyes. I mean, it, it's something uh, which should be uh, monitored very, very carefully. So that's why I think we will, uh, at least uh, my proposal would be as uh, the European Union applies more um, uh, kind of effectively this rule of law conditionality towards our cooperation with uh, Eastern Partnership countries. We can't wait for better times. Sometimes we hear it. I mean, we need some uh, extra um, time to come in, in future and then we will be performing differently. I think we should ask uh, a full performance on rule of law in particular, as soon as possible, right now, right here. Secondly, on security situation. Here I think uh, the <clears throat> question is, is very uh, correct and, uh, and very good one, uh, taking into account the situation, especially on the Eastern uh, um, uh, Ukrainian borders uh, uh, situation. Uh, I'm looking forward for more creative political thinking on EU side. 
we have some uh, modalities and we have some more instrumentarium from uh, EU side, which might be immediately uh, used in case of Ukraine. For example, uh, 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 civilian uh, CSDP missions. We need more. If we're not ready yet for uh, full-scale uh, um, CSDP military missions in, uh, in, in Ukraine, assisting uh, Ukrainian military forces for defense and uh, um, uh, other operations uh, in mind. So let's do it with a civilian mission. And probably time is right, right now. I mean, before, uh, before uh, Christmas, I mean, to make uh, a political commitment, taking into account uh, uh, Biden's, Putin's uh, conversation um, from yesterday. And we need something practical. I mean, our political uh, messaging is not uh, enough, for, especially for Ukraine, to secure its, uh, its future. Mr. Meridis, over to you. Oops. Thank you very much. Um, both important questions. Um, clearly, uh, it's important to advance uh, on these fundamental reforms uh, as fast as possible. I think uh, surveys show that these are the is issues that matter most to citizens, and I would highlight in particular judicial reform. Um, in terms of how best to achieve this, um, I would also nonetheless like to be clear, five years ago in the European Neighbourhood Policy Review, we discussed what was the best form of um, uh, monitoring and reporting, and we agreed it was, because of the differentiated aspirations, uh, we agreed it was important to have di also differentiated monitoring and reporting, and that's why um, I don't think we need um, a new enlargement package style or go back to what we had before. I think what we need to do is ensure in each of the, the tailor-made bilateral relations that we go deep enough and clearly enough into the issues of justice and home affairs uh, and, of course, also security. And that is perfectly possible, for example, in the implementation reports of the associated countries, uh, which is their roadmap uh, towards the European Union, to be very clear. So it's very important that we highlight it uh, in that discussion that we have with them uh, bilaterally. Um, equally, of course, where there is an appetite for reform, and I'm thinking also of Armenia, the European Union strongly encourages that. We're not closing the door to anybody who wants to do judicial reform. It's not a club for the associated countries. And where we see that prospect, and we hope uh, that the democratic forces um, will um, get their opportunity also, for example, in Belarus. So, I mean, we would like to see the future where um, this uh, we want a democratic, uh, gov well-governed Eastern partnership across the board. That's really important. On the security issue, uh, I think the European Union has signaled strongly its willingness to step up its engagement on the unresolved conflicts. Uh, as Petros says, we have increasing instruments and Petros is putting forward, um, as always, new and creative ideas as to what we could take on board. I think we're ready um, to step up that engagement. And we're looking at exactly that, how, how best to do it. Um, and it's important that we do that. Um, and here I would see, nonetheless, a particular potential for deeper engagement with the associated countries. I think it's important to be clear that on the security side, that that's evident. Um, so um, uh, the EU is ready on both accounts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, this is as much time as we have for Q&A right now. We'll move to the next segment of the agenda, but we will come back to these issues also in the final Q&A uh, with, the, with the audience and the other speakers uh, and MEPs who will join us later. Thank you very much, Mr. Meredith, for joining us and for your intervention and for very helpful overview and comments. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. All the best. So we now invite uh, Sophia Strife, who is co-chair of the steering committee of the Eastern Partnership Civil Society Forum to give us a perspective from civil society uh, on the expectations of the summit uh, and what civil society would like to see uh, come out next week, what uh, civil society would like to see more of uh, in the post-2020 agenda and beyond. Sophia, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, 
um, and dear colleagues, dear distinguished speakers and audience, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the introduction. Um, on behalf of the steering committee of the Eastern Partnership Civil Society Forum, uh, I, then Sophia Strive, the co-chair of the steering committee, would like to thank you for, first of all, the invitation to this online meeting. Uh, and we uh, agree that the focus to dedicate this on the EAP uh, summit is extremely timely and super important to also have civil society invited to. And I'm happy to participate at this event, uh, with, especially with these distinguished speakers, and share some of the forum's expectations and aspirations for the summit, but also some reflections on what we believe the new EIP agenda could be further, further strengthened with. And also thank you, Petras, for mentioning in your opening remarks uh, the appreciation to the civil society's a critically correct, as you put it, input um, that we have shared and uh, which many times have been welcomed and taken into consideration. And we are, of course, uh, always open to provide input and share reflections from the civil society perspective. And I'm happy to hear that it's appreciated and taken into consideration. So we are looking forward to maintain and continue that cooperation. Um, so for the current challenges in the AP region are unprecedented and reinforced by the COVID-19 pandemic, the political crisis and shrinking civic space. Notwithstanding these tough times, we want the upcoming EAP summit to send a strong message about the transformational ambitions of the new agenda. And we also hope that the summit could reflect the EU's intentions to assist in leveraging the EAP country's economic power enhanced by the investment pillar and to collaborate jointly in addressing the global challenges arising from the climate crisis, as well as the new possibilities and risks associated with using new digital technologies. But most importantly, we hope that the EAP summit and the new agenda will be based on core values and an inclusive approach where civil society is meaningfully included in every step of the way. And during the past year, with all its invisible and highly visible enemies and challenges, the civil society in the EAP has shown an immense level of innovation, determination, bravery and courage. When moving forward with the new framework of the EAP, it is vital that we therefore ensure that civil society is meaningfully included throughout the process, from the planning and implementation to the monitoring and evaluation part. And including the voice of civil society is the only way to ensure that building back better will really become better for all groups of society, for all regions of the countries and for all needs in a long term perspective. So as civil society, we would like to strongly underline yet again our commitment to contribute to the successful to the success and coherence of this new era. And at the same time, it is our mission to also voice our concerns and suggestions to make sure it delivers for the benefit of civil society as a whole, for every citizen of the AP, without leaving anyone behind. So with that said, we welcome that the EU will continue to promote an enabling environment for civil society through favorable regulatory frameworks in line with international standards. And we do, of course, also appreciate that the EU will double its support to grassroots organizations, support which is particularly important amidst the COVID-19 pandemic and the ongoing challenges of shrinking civic space in the region. At the same time, we wish to emphasize that there should be more accountability for delivering on the objective of supporting civil society. We believe it would be effective if the progress the countries make in enabling civil society to operate is linked to economic benefits offered by the new agenda. Moreover, when looking towards the implementation of the agenda and how to ensure that it's sustainable and inclusive, we strongly believe that it's important that the new roadmap is enforcing that civil society is meaningfully included in the decision-making process, as well as the implementation of monitoring, which I touched upon before. And one thing that I would like to make very clear is that we are grateful for how the EU has put more emphasis on youth compared to what we have seen before in the 20 deliverables for 2020, for instance. But since our role is also to highlight what we think could be strengthened, um, I would I have to say that we find it worrying that marginalized groups are not included in a more systematic manner in the new EIP agenda and the joint staff working document. 
We would like to see more emphasis on people with mental and physical disabilities. We think that it we have to talk about and focus on LGBTQI people and address the needs of elderly, IDPs, ethnic minorities, as well as people in rural areas specifically. And therefore, I was also happy to hear that Mr. Lawrence Meredith actually mentioned people in rural areas in his speech. But I think the term inclusivity have to be broadened and have to look beyond uh, youth and civil society and also include marginalized groups specifically in their particular needs. On the topic of gender equality, we believe that it's important that the EU support to the EAP countries is in line with the EU Gender Action Plan 2021 to 2025 and should mainstream gender equality not only in economic sectors, but in all parts of society. I could speak a lot on gender equality, but I will leave it <laughs> Uh, like that for now. We have to jointly make sure that important values such as human rights, rule of law and democratic accountability are at the basis for building resilience and the future of the EAP as such. In this sense, the Eastern Partnership Civil Society Forum would like to see a more comprehensive approach in the governance part of the new agenda and better defined benchmarks and indicators that would facilitate monitoring of the joint delivery of the respective targets. Citizens of the EAP should be reassured that democratic governance is at the heart of strengthening resilience through the new policy agenda and that joint delivery also means joint accountability. Furthermore, I would like to highlight the deteriorating security situation in the region. Connected to a number of uh, unfortunate events in the EAP region, which I will not go into detail about here, but I'm sure that you are well aware of them. Uh, the security, security situation has never been worse than it is today for people in the EAP. And I'm referring then to individual security, where we see peaks in cases of domestic violence, poverty and unemployment. I'm referring to digital security risks with an increased level of cyber threats, state propaganda and fake news. And I am referring to state security where our EAP colleagues face threats from neighbors and foreign powers. And these security risks have different forms, but all have devastating consequences for the whole population. And we therefore believe that increased efforts needs to be done and security should go hand in hand with resilience when framing the new targets for the EAP. In summary, and now I'm approaching the end, I believe the post-2020 priorities deserve more focused ambitions in the governance pillar in order to make the development inclusive, fair and sustainable. The way the EU is promoting economic development as the main objective risk losing the value based approach to development. And we argue that it would be beneficial to instead use economic development to leverage the development of rule of law and democratic governance and linking economic benefits to tangible improvements in governance. Otherwise, there is a clear risk that the lack of balance between supporting economic recovery and democratic development will res result in an even further regression of democracy and human rights than we are already looking at today. And therefore, I would like to finish off by saying that now the expectations are high on the EAP summit to send a clear message that the agenda will be based on core values and an inclusive approach with democratic governance and inclusivity at the heart of strengthening resilience. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Sophia. We are already uh, a little bit uh, ahead of our schedule in time. But I, I did want to ask you one question specifically. If there's, if there's one thing that you would like to leave us with, uh, what would you say is the one new initiative or project uh, or deliverable uh, that the EU should um, offer within the new Eastern Partnership Framework or post the 2020 agenda to support better civil society in the region, to deliver on the stated objective of supporting civil society? On that specific objective of civil society, I think it's core that in terms of including civil society, it's throughout all processes. It's throughout the decision making, it's throughout the monitoring, it's throughout the implementation. Because otherwise, by including it too late, it would be uh, less successful and valuable. And I think it's uh, based on how strong and committed the civil society have proven to be and how useful in identifying trends and needs in areas where 
a few other actors can reach. I think it's proven that including them throughout the process is uh, core in order to deliver on these promises. Thank you very much. Uh, unless there's any reaction from uh, Petras, Petras, would you like to um, comment uh, on the civil society input very briefly? And then we will move to the discussion with the six representatives of the Eastern Partnership countries. Iska, I, I will be very short. Uh, we appreciate uh, our cooperation and very, I would say, productive cooperation with the civic society and NGOs in uh, Eastern Partnership countries. You know, I'm happy to see a very good involvement of, um, uh, of the civic society into the reforms process of those countries. Looking back, I mean, how many um, really good experts, competitive and, uh, uh, you know, professional experts from NGO, from civic society were involved into the governance, uh, um, uh, public governance uh, of uh, uh, of the um, of the Eastern Partnership countries, I'm very happy to see this progress. I mean, more and more, you know, people from civic society are given really uh, key positions in those countries, and I think it brings uh, a kind of belief in something new, in a, in a progressive uh, reforms and progressive involvement uh, uh, involving uh, process of uh, um, of the governance in in those countries. But uh, still, much to be to be done, and I, I hope that. Uh, this uh, genuine dialogue between civic society and uh, governments and, and political elites in uh, Eastern Partnership countries will continue. This is so needed, I mean, for both sides. Thank you very much, Petras. And on that note, we, uh, we move to the six uh, representatives from the Eastern Partnership countries. And actually, some of them do come from civil society. So this is indeed very, uh, very good to see. Uh, we will have um, introductory remarks of uh, seven minutes each and hopefully a little bit of time to, uh, to engage in a few questions and answers after that. So since two of our speakers need to leave a little bit sooner, uh, we will start first with uh, Mr. Pariur Hofhanisyan, who is the Deputy Foreign Minister of Armenia, and then move to Mr. Sevolod Chensov, who is the Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary Head of the Mission of Ukraine to the European Union. So first, Mr. Hofhanisyan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, warm greetings to participants, and I recognize some old friends uh, among uh, among them. And uh, sincere gratitude to Mr. Uh, Austrevich to organize this timely event uh, to share our thoughts and ideas about the future cooperation uh, under the auspices of the Eastern uh, Partnership. Uh, I would start with the with, uh, pandemic, uh, the new type uh, of coronavirus pandemic created a new reality. In this sense, I would like to use this opportunity and thank the European Union for support and assistance provided uh, so far. We welcome the decision of uh, European Commission of um, August uh, 2021 to increase the assistance package for the Eastern Partnership countries in order to deploy safe and effective COVID-19 vaccines and speed up the vaccination uh, campaigns. Uh, on behalf of Armenian government, I also would like to extend uh, the, the, the uh, now gratitude to those uh, European uh, Union members who extended their hand of assistance um, during the last two years. Um, much needed medical equipment uh, was was provided. Uh, the medical team was involved, uh, and of course, the the nation of life saving vaccines was uh, crucial. Uh, I would like to, in particular, single out DG Echo. They consistently coordinated the efforts among the EU member states. Uh, dear colleagues, the climate change remains on the top of our agenda. Uh, Armenia, with its landlocked mountainous ecosystem, becoming more and more vulnerable to the climate change. Uh, in recent years, we experienced an unprecedented number of extensive um, forest uh, fires. The country has already registered one in three degree uh, Celsius average uh, temperature increase, uh, which is higher than the uh, global average. 
to the five year program of the of the government prioritize a green and resilient recovery to be boosted through low carbon climate adaptable development and circular economy model um, we adopted several laws focus on developing domestic especially renewable uh, energy resources and implementing energy efficiency measures um, so the efforts in these directions are continuous. Following up the topic of energy efficiency, Armenia uh, welcomes the recovery, resilience and reform post-2020 Eastern Partnership priorities, joint staff working document, the ambitious uh, economic and investment plan, and its deriving flagship initiatives, that, which are set to strengthen resilience and generate concrete benefits to our people. The priority projects span from supporting a sustainable and innovative and competitive economy, boosting connectivity, socioeconomic uh, development, investing in digital transformation, science and technology, investing in energy efficiency to building uh, resilience uh, in the southern regions. Successful implementation of those uh, flagship uh, will undoubtedly contribute to Armenia's further development and will support the most critical segment of our economy. Um, uh, just recently, uh, uh, November 26, the agreement on the Yerevan bus project, Green Buses, was signed. So now we're already in the process of implementing one of the flagships, the main goal of which is to contribute to reduction of emissions and promote clean energy. Uh, another important topic is strengthening democratic institutions, consolidating uh, rule of law. Mm, uh, the anti-corruption elements is high in our reform uh, agenda, and here we work closely with the uh, EU. Um, the entry into force of uh, the SEPA um, on the 1st of March 2020 is a milestone in, in our relations with the, with the EU. Agreement has definitely its positive impact on uh, bilateral relations with your member states, contribute enormously to promoting the institution building and reform agenda. Um, the bulk of the separate reforms connected with uh, independent judiciary and uh, fight against corruption. Uh, we committed to implementation of all provisions uh, of, the, of the agreement. Um, I would like to also mention a few uh, mainstream agreements which have been signed recently. It's Armenia EU Common Aviation Area Agreement, uh, one between Armenia and uh, Europol, uh, Horizon Europe Framework Program and Research and Innovation, then um, uh, our association to Creative Europe 2021 2027. Uh, so all these tools would allow to boost the cooperation further. The um, uh, last two years have been especially difficult for us. It's pandemic, it's result of the 44 days war. Uh, we must realize here that how much danger the hate speech and war propaganda might, uh, might do. I would quote here the uh, ECRI, European Commission on Racial Discrimination and Equality Statement adopted earlier this year, which highlighted all the risks in, in these connections. Of course, this statement was adopted uh, under the uh, influence of the um, uh, war last, last year. And here we expect from the European uh, Union to be more straightforward in addressing the root cause of the um, escalation that was accompanied by the massive and grave human rights uh, violations, as a result of which the innocent and peaceful people suffered. Uh, we believe um, uh, you could be more vocal in uh, flagrant and grave human rights violations in general. Um, Use of force cannot contribute to the establishment of the confidence building measures, as well as to the atmosphere of, uh, of peace. Um, I would like to also comment on the uh, negotiations around the summit declaration. I've been informed by the colleagues from the mission. At the beginning, we seen the document, which was uh, 
rather pragmatic and concrete. Nevertheless, we see now the attempts to to water down the whole content. And uh, I believe um, just a DAP declaration to show there was a, a paper adapted, it's, it's not the final goal. Um, I think the summit declaration of uh, 2017 was more or less balanced and uh, that was the one of rare cases when sites were able to agree on the text. Uh, nevertheless, 2000 on, for 2019, the sites couldn't come for a consensus and it was no joint announcement. Anyway, our proposal, our, our position is uh, basically we share the EU approach. The document should be focused on deepening relations with the European Union. And of course it should be meaningful uh, and that stance remains there. We really hope we could come to, to, to a result, but again, um, a meaningful result at the end of these negotiations. Once again, thank you for this uh, initiative uh, and uh, again, greetings from, from Romania. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. And you touched on a number of important points and specifically this issue of the forthcoming summit declaration. I'm sure other speakers will also uh, have comments to make here. And I, I, I address the general question to all of our um, uh, contributors. Uh, if you could uh, highlight uh, what what more would you like to see in that declaration, but also anything that you consider a particular achievement uh, on the occasion of this summit. This would be uh, very interesting to put out for discussion. Uh, we now give the floor to the head of the mission of Ukraine to the European Union, Mr. Chensov, please. Hello. <clears throat> Uh, good afternoon to, to everybody. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. And uh, I would also join previous speakers uh, and thank uh, Petrus Ostravichus for uh, organizing this event, uh, getting us together. Also very pleased to see uh, uh, friends and colleagues. Uh, and uh, uh, definitely it's a very uh, good timing for the event. Uh, to organize it in the run out, in the run up uh, to the summit, uh, basically in in one week, uh, which gives us uh, an opportunity to take stock uh, what have uh, have been done uh, during during the last two years after the last summit, but also uh, to have uh, quite a realistic picture what we can expect uh, from the forthcoming uh, Eastern Partnership Summit. And definitely, uh, I would agree uh, with uh, Mr. Ostravichus and other speakers uh, and confirm that uh, this summit uh, will be a hold in a very peculiar context, uh, first of all, security context, and uh, the situation on Ukrainian and Russian border have been already mentioned. Uh, the tension uh, relatively have been diffused uh, due to the uh, yesterday, uh, conversation uh, between President uh, Biden and, and Putin, uh, but definitely it's it's only the, the first uh, significant step, and there's there was rather exchange exchange of positions, and uh, as I said, the, the the good thing is that it happened that the conversation is ongoing, but we would definitely count on further robust uh, actions uh, and readiness to to act and to uh, mount pressure on Russia in case uh, the situation the situation is further escalated. So this is a very difficult uh, context uh, to uh, to uh, discuss. Uh, how to uh, how to develop this in the Eastern Partnership because it is important to have a common agenda for both EU member states and partner states in the field of uh, development of the, the security security pillar of Eastern Partnership development of the 
economic uh, sectoral cooperation within the partnership. And we need, for that reason, to have a common understanding and common assessment of the situation, which is not always the case. And definitely, this is a challenge. How to develop uh, this new strategy for the next, uh, for the next period. Uh, and definitely, uh, we are ready for this conversation and we are preparing the uh, participation of our leadership in the summit and definitely we have uh, our uh, own uh, ideas and uh, uh, new targets uh, what uh, this partnership should reach both in the foreseeable uh, and uh, distant future i would uh, in that context i would agree that uh, the partnership should be uh, forward looking and set ambitious goals uh, for those countries, for those states who are ready and eager to reach those goals. And we are not shy uh, to repeat time and again that uh, Ukraine uh, is interested to become a full-fledged member of the Euro European Union. It's not a matter of uh, to discuss uh, time now, but this is a strategic goal, and it is fixed in the Ukrainian constitution, and uh, the internal reforms and the implementation of association agreement uh, we consider as a as a toolkit to reach this goal in the future. And in in that regard, I would like to to come back to the. Uh, um, to the basis of uh, of founding uh, steps uh, of stones of this partnership uh, announced back in 2009. Uh, and I would remind that association agreements and visa dialogues, they are uh, announced as a, as a medium term goals to be reached. So it was a change. And the question now, for those countries who are ready to move forward, what are uh, the immediate, uh, the, those interim goals? And definitely, uh, we, can, uh, we can now discuss, and it, I'm, uh, I, I hope that it will be also reflected in the uh, joint declaration that such goals as joining internal market, uh, or further uh, steps in uh, in our cooperation in the in the field of home and justice affairs uh, will be envisaged because we need uh, to reach tangible results and we need uh, to to see concrete steps how we get there so those and as I said those goals they should not be uh, the common goals for the all, all six or now five countries because of the situation with Belarus. And uh, uh, for, for that reason, Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia, uh, they unite efforts and uh, they are building up uh, cooperation in the format of associated trio. So we do, look, do not consider uh, this initiative as a challenge to the unity of the Eastern Partnership, but to the contrary, uh, as an initiative which would help to operationalize or instrumentalize uh, the idea of more, or more and less to less uh, principle enshrined in the whole logic of the Eastern Partnership. So it would help on one hand, to craft a specific, distinctive agenda for those three countries who want and dare to move forward in their relations with the European Union, but also to serve as an example for other countries for which, for a time being, choose another path in their relations with the European Union, but one day they could change their mind and follow the suit. So we don't need 
within the Eastern Partnership uh, to aim to reach kind of a average temperature in the room, but to the contrary, to be flexible enough uh, to satisfy those more ambitious, but also to keep uh, links and develop cooperation with the rest of the countries. And once again, to serve as a good example and of the stronger partnership with the European Union. As uh, deliverables uh, for this summit, as I said, uh, we would like to see the trio initiative and uh, distinctive agenda acknowledged uh, by the uh, European Union. We are ready to suggest and hope uh, the member states and the institutions would support concrete uh, new steps in the field of sectoral dialogue, economic cooperation, and as an example, I would give uh, European Green Deal for digitalization, which shows that we go hand in hand with the Union and try to align our policies, our legislation, with, with, the, with the new tendencies, with the new trends in the Union. And, and I think this is the essence of the partnership that countries uh, really try to, uh, to follow the best practices and uh, participate in, in the EU policies to the extent, pol uh, to the extent possible. Uh, and definitely, uh, the partnership should remain flexible to address uh, common challenges as pandemic, uh, as support of the civil society, people-to-people -people contact, cultural cooperation, uh, so on and so forth. So the Eastern Partnership uh, could envisage a combination of different setups, different initiatives, different instruments, which could be fine-tuned according to the needs of each and every partners, to the group of partners, geographical groups, uh, and to remain comfortable and once again, future-oriented and ambitious initiative. I think I will stop here and I will be ready to answer eventual questions. Thank you very much once again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, and we will now move to the representatives of the two other trio countries, in fact, and I do invite them as well to uh, state if they wish the, the added value that they see in this initiative, because of course it is now much debated, and perhaps uh, uh, to refer back to one point that Petrus made earlier, uh, how this initiative could help put in practice uh, the commitment to the um, aspirations of these three countries. Uh, there are, of course, many security issues to discuss, and I'd like to um, also refer to comments that Mr. Meredith made, uh, that the EU indeed is ready to step up engagement on the security side, especially with the three associated countries. So how uh, would you see this uh, from your side? Uh, and what is the contribution that you think the EU can make and the Eastern Partnership can make specifically to improving the security of your countries? Please do stick to the seven minutes that you have so that we can then have also time for more discussion. And I now introduce uh, Mr. David, Bujiashvili, who is the Director of the EU Assistance and Sectorial Integration Department of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Georgia. Mr. Bujiashvili, please take the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me. I just want to uh, thank the organizers for putting all the Eastern Partners, uh, Eastern Partnership countries together very timely on a very timely topic just in the run up of the Eastern Partnership Summit which we hope that will create a good space for discussion, good avenue for discussing future priorities and will play up the expectations of all Eastern Partnership countries. While the main subject of today's discussion is uh, future priorities and ways to succeed, I think it's important uh, to take stock of what's been done, where Eastern Partnership was successful, where we went well, where it went well, where we could improve it, what was the challenges, and based on that, to 
make reflections on the future priorities of the Eastern Partnership. Almost uh, 12 years has passed since launching of the Eastern Partnership in 2009. Georgia managed to demonstrate increasingly strong political will and achieved substantial progress in achieving all the commitments that's been set at the very beginning. And it led to bringing concrete, measurable and tangible results for the country, be it associated membership, uh, deeper political, economic, sectoral integration, DCFTA, which made possible to be more resilient in reforming and diversifying our economy, and of course, visa liberalization, that remains one of the most tangible benefits that uh, Georgia received at the expense of implementation of very challenging reforms, sometimes uh, costly, uh, not easy ones, and sometimes unpopular in a traditional society. Um, to be honest, uh, 12, 15 years ago, nobody could imagine in Georgia that Georgia could achieve such higher degree of integration with the EU as we enjoy now. As for the future of the Eastern Partnership, uh, there is no denying that there is a division within, within the Eastern Partnership. There are two groups. Uh, one group of the countries is called uh, TRIO, which uh, managed to achieve, to make the most, to get the maximum benefits from uh, all the benefits offered. And another group of countries which have different policies for different reasons. And it's up to each country to choose the level and degree of integration with the EU they wish to have. Uh, in that context, I just want to say and echo the other speakers that uh, we think that there is a need for greater differentiation, more for more, which is already in place, but to make it much more uh, tangible, to uh, set much more tangible and concrete benchmarks and uh, uh, strengths and application of the more for more. Apart from that, uh, in this context, uh, we think that success of the Eastern Partnership and uh, associated partners is a thanks to uh, setting very tangible and concrete measurable benchmarks at the very beginning, because everyone could see what is on stake, visa-free, associated membership, free trade, and that helped in incentivizing this reform. That gave additional drive and that was the main uh, factors in terms of success of Georgia. Uh, and uh, the, main, uh, the main goal for today is to make sure that process is not stalled, it's moving forward, and uh, it uh, continues to deliver tangible results for our countries and our societies. As for the uh, declaration, and we studied uh, this declaration, draft of the declaration, I think it's not bad could be better uh, but uh, and much more ambitious, but that's what we have. Uh, as for the Georgia's priorities, I'm, we are running out of the time. I will be very brief. Uh, connectivity, we appreciate the connectivity is part of this, and in Georgian context, it's very extremely important. As Georgia does not enjoy common land border with the EU, only Black Sea is the main bridge, and in that context, uh, uh, connecting our ports, Batumi, Poti, with uh, Constanza, Varna, Burgas, uh, and uh, moving forward, our trade uh, directly with the, its very important aspect and uh, improving our physical connections. Uh, in addition, Georgia is committed to intensify sectoral cooperation in such strategic areas like transport, energy, in order to make a maximum use of our transit potential by offering alternative uh, routes for delivering energy resources from Caspian through Georgian territory, Black Sea and to Europe, and thereby contributing to the diversification of the Europe's energy supplies. Deeper integration to the EU single market. And uh, so that's everyone's uh, kind of objective. But at the same time, we understand that much has to be done on our own in terms of improving our food safety standards, alignment with our uh, alignment with the national EU legislation, EU aki, et etc. Et uh, integration into the SEPA, digital harmonization of roaming tariffs, green transformation. And uh, I just uh, want to say that Georgia has done a lot, particularly in terms of energy efficiency. We have adopted very ambitious energy efficiency legislation already ready to be uh, put in place and ready for implementation. Last but not least, uh, so in terms of ambition of the declaration, 
I think that uh, we hope that uh, it's not realistic now, but in the future, we hope that there will be a more sort of enough courage and vision from the EU side to its partners to demonstrate that there is a way ahead, there is a light at, at the end of the tunnel, that there is a way after the association agreement, and there should be signals for those countries who are willing, who are able, capable and ready to go through this difficult path. And Georgia has announced its desire to make application in 2024. Uh, we believe that uh, for the EU membership and we believe that it will be well understood because we are not talking about membership tomorrow. We are not ready and Europe is not ready. But it's about, uh, it's absolutely important for domestic and international purposes. Domestically in order to incentivize our reform process to set the final goal, final policy objective, and also externally to make sure to demonstrate to those who believe that, uh, to demonstrate, uh, to show to them that uh, Eastern Partnership continues to deliver and it's uh, still uh, operational. So um, the flagships were mentioned and many projects, uh, programs, but just I want to say that it's uh, good, but not enough. Uh, projects uh, and financial assistance is accompanying policy objectives. First is policy, and then it comes the projects and assistance. So I think there is a need for more tangible policy objectives, and European perspective is one of the uh, most important ones. At the same time, we should not forget that uh, the countries, Georgia and uh, countries of the Eastern Partnership, are facing security threats, and uh, uh, we have to deal with dramatically changed security environment. In Georgian case, 20% of the, our territory still continues to remain under Russian occupation. Uh, Moscow continues to violate our borders, violate international law and the six point ceasefire agreement signed by their own president. Um, Annexation policy continues, I mean, this borderization, barbed wire, separating families from each other, which has extremely negative impact on Georgia's security environment and whole on the whole region. Georgia is not an isolated case. We see what's happening in Ukraine, uh, annexation of Crimea, what's happening in Donbass, Lugansk, uh, Transnistria is Mol in Moldova. None of these cases are an isolated ones. All of them are part of Russia's wider strategy, scenario of increasing its dominance by creating spheres of influence. So we are actually punished for our sovereign choice to be a part of European and Euro-Atlantic community, for our commitment. Uh, on uh, top of that, uh, this information, propaganda, that's common to all of us and we expect support of the EU in that respect. And we see the rise of uh, propagandistic uh, sources. Uh, they try to change kind of manipulate with psychological map of the people that they have about what's going on in their countries in order to set one group within the country against another and destabilize situation uh, and last but uh, so what i say that uh, we appreciate support of the eu in general in conflict resolution in confidence building measures and we expect uh, in the future more active engagement and practical support in that respect so and without security guarantees, it would be difficult to sustain not only enthusiasm for reforms, but also popular support. So thank you very much and uh, looking forward if there is any question to respond. Thank you very much. And I hand over the floor directly to Christina Gerasimov, who is foreign policy advisor to the president of the Republic of Moldova. Christina, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Iskra. Uh, thank you very much, Petras, for this invitation uh, to join this uh, discussion on the mid and long term key priorities just ahead of the long awaited uh, summit that we hopefully are going to have uh, next week. I'd like to start a little bit about the changes that have taken place in uh, Moldova this year as preconditions for also what we can uh, expect uh, for the EU EP uh, cooperation um, in the next years. Um, the parliamentary elections that we saw this summer were really, you know, a, a unique opportunity, I would say, for the country to implement some of the most difficult transformations. Uh, which are much easier to, to be achieved by a single party majority in parliament than by a coalition government. 
and this is taken very seriously by uh, by uh, the current uh, ruling elite. Uh, such political constellation of factors uh, are very rare for those who are watching closely Moldova's path since independence, and it's truly creates real opportunities for the country to uh, push its transformation um, agenda forward. And I think at the same time, we do see very high expectations from the new government, particularly uh, in the first three months, uh, with very high both domestic and international expectation, and they continue to, to be so. Um, at the same time, um, you know, these have to be calibrated so that um, to do so, it's really, really important to understand what this government has inherited. And here, um, I think if we speak about very weak state institutions, corrupt practices, rent-seeking schemes in many, many public institutions, the international support uh, that could come uh, uh, through uh, the EP uh, framework um, uh, is very timely and, and important. At the same time, of course, the country faces the same international challenges as the rest of the world. Um, uh, COVID, uh, be it climate change or the economic uh, consequences of, of COVID, and these do require not only European solidarity, but also uh, global solidarity to, to be overcome. Um, and in this domestic uh, context for Moldova, I think that next year is for the cooperation between the Eastern Partnership uh, uh, Eastern Partners and the EU have really to be about strengthening our resilience, both as a region, but also as individual countries. And this has been mentioned by uh, previous speakers that the challenges uh, that we all face are both common, but also quite peculiar to, to each of the uh, six uh, countries. So while facing similar challenges, uh, uh, you know, we also need to have uh, a more enhanced uh, uh, bilateral agenda uh, with, uh, with the EU, which does happen uh, uh, you know, uh, across across the region. So to make this process sustainable, we need to really keep focus on what is probably the most difficult reform for the entire region. And as has been mentioned, both by uh, Petras and uh, uh, and by the um, uh, previous speakers, the reform of the justice sector. And here, it's really uh, crucial to understand how important independent and accountable judges and prosecutors uh, are uh, to, you know, for the ability of, of, of the states to strengthen their um, investment climate uh, in, in, in their countries uh, that will subsequently attract hopefully more investments, create new jobs and increase standards of living for, for everyone. We also need to focus on strengthening critical infrastructure. Uh, all of these countries still, you know, have the basic uh, fundamental problems uh, when it comes to either roads, railways, schools or hospitals. Uh, if we can do it also across the region with neighboring countries, this will start to strengthen our collective re uh, regional resilience. And in this context, the upcoming Eastern Partnership Summit is a unique opportunity to, to strengthen our collective resilience by agreeing on a more ambitious uh, uh, agenda on a um, more strategic approach about how we move um, forward. And in this context, we do see uh, this cooperation to be based on, of course, mutual commitments to a strategic, ambitious and forward-looking agenda, uh, which should be based subsequently on common fundamental values, mutual interest and shared ownership, very important. Um, this cooperation's long-term goal, uh, I think, should be the same as it has been uh, defined, the political association and economic integration, uh, particularly for these countries willing to see closer ties with, with the EU, like the associated trio. Uh, we're confident on our side uh, that the economic and investment plan for, for the Eastern Partnership and its flagship initiatives for the partner countries will uh, uh, have a significant impact towards achieving this uh, goal. At the same time, it's very clear for us what the priorities uh, should be uh, for, for, for the upcoming years. 
Uh, and here, I think there is, you know, considering that there was such a comprehensive assessment uh, uh, done uh, before the long-term uh, policy objectives have been defined, we do see, I think, a good suitability between the needs of the region, but also the, the, the objectives defined, such as, you know, increased trade, strength and connectivity, deepened economic integration, uh, and the strengthening of, of, of good governance. Uh, we're very much interested also in deepening cooperation with the EU when it comes to sectorial integration. And here, you know, we have seen multiple signals coming from the associated trio, um, um, be it either on energy, on connectivity, uh, security, or on the digital agenda for the region. Um, on energy, Moldova clearly needs to focus on diversifying its sources um, uh, of energy supply. I think the most recent gas crisis that uh, we went through has proven how vulnerable we have been for the last three decades. And this has you know, strengthened our commitment to invest more in renewables in domestic production and storage of energy sources. Um, and, and here, you know, strengthening the European energy security as a whole uh, by making full use of existing gas transmission routes uh, or the full application of the EU legislation, as well as the synchronization of electricity networks should definitely be a priority. On uh, connectivity, uh, we do look, uh, you know, for the need to have a more enhanced uh, 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 framework uh, also when it comes to transport links between the EU and the associated uh, uh, trio in particular. Uh, but I think this should be also relevant for the entire region, uh, which, you know, could also include uh, uh, the development uh, of road transportation, liberalization agreements, uh, the development of uh, transport corridors or joint uh, infrastructure projects. On security, I think this is clear for all where the, you know, where the boundaries of cooperation are for this moment uh, in, 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 in this cooperation. We very much look forward to developing, uh, you know, concrete uh, cooperation with the European Peace Facility and participation in, in, in PESCO projects. So to conclude, I would just like to say that, um, you know, especially for the three associated countries, uh, we do see today much more integration with the EU than we have seen before in the last 10 years. Uh, you know, economically, um, through trade or socially, through people-to-people -people contacts, but also through educational programs. And today, Moldova's exports uh, have really, uh, you know, hit a record high of 67% uh, share going to the EU. Uh, we also see, uh, you know, Transn the Transnistrian region's uh, access to this DCFTA uh, integrating the region economically into Europe, which we do assess as a positive development. Um, and overall, this, you know, brings us to, to the idea that really deeper and more comprehensive ties need to be further developed um, as the majority of the people uh, living in this country see themselves part of, of the European family. And I will stop here and look forward to the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina. And now uh, we go to Valery Kavalowski, who is head of the cabinet uh, and representative on foreign affairs of the office of Svetlana Tikhanovskaya. Petros has already shared the good news that Belarus, uh, the Belarusian Democratic Opposition, will be invited to the summit. Uh, Mr. Kavalowski, what <laughs> kind of message are you hoping to see next week come out of Brussels? The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Iskra, and thank you very much uh, to uh, Petra Saustrevicius uh, for organizing this discussion, for inviting us uh, to be part of this. It's a pleasure and an honor uh, to be um, to be discussing uh, the current state of affairs in the Eastern Partnership uh, and, and the future uh, for all of us. Uh, Belarus sees itself as part of the European family and appreciates uh, the, uh, the place and role of Belarus in the Eastern Partnership. 
Uh, I will briefly um, review the situation uh, with Belarus participation in the partnership at this point of time uh, and the position of, uh, of the society, of people of Belarus uh, on the partnership uh, amidst the, the circumstances of today and also speak a little bit about the perspectives uh, for further engagements uh, uh, in the current context. And I would also appreciate actually the perspective of um, uh, of partner countries uh, from their capitals on uh, how they see uh, the place and role of Belarus in Eastern Partnership, given the, the latest developments. Uh, so, uh, as for the situation of today, uh, you know that over summer, uh, Lukashenko uh, decided to suspend participation of Belarus uh, in the uh, Eastern Partnership Initiative. Uh, before that, uh, he uh, he rigged elections in August 2020 and uh, uh, reportedly, according to all reports, uh, according to parallel vote count, uh, he's lost the elections and he refused to concede and step down. Instead, he responded with uh, violence and repressions uh, to people's uh, protests uh, in, uh, in Belarus uh, and he retains power uh, as of today. Uh, however, he does not have the legitimacy. Uh, he doesn't have legitimacy inside Belarus. He doesn't have legitimacy internationally. Uh, European Union uh, uh, in the whole uh, refused to recognize uh, Lukashenko as legitimate president. Uh, therefore, his, uh, uh, his decisions uh, like suspension of uh, uh, Belarus participation in Eastern Partnership Initiative cannot be recognized as valid. Uh, and therefore, uh, Belarusian people said uh, Lukashenko leaves, Belarus stays. Uh, for us, Eastern Partnership Initiative is an important uh, platform uh, that we consider uh, as an excellent uh, uh, mechanism to develop relationship uh, between uh, Belarus and the EU. Uh, we see a lot of potential. We know how to do this. We know what ne we need to do uh, to, uh, to use the potential, to develop the potential of, uh, of relations. Uh, between Belarus and uh, and the EU, and uh, we know for a fact that e that Belarus could not uh, do this. Uh, kind of in all honesty, uh, Lukashenko's uh, participation in Eastern Partnership has always been uh, rather mediocre, to say the least, and uh, uh, it's been the, the worst student in the class, uh, definitely. And uh, <clears throat> we uh, we always saw this as a lost opportunity for uh, for our relationship with the EU, and we want to 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 make it better. And in addition to that, of course, we consider uh, uh, the partnership as, as a platform for developing relations, relations uh, with uh, uh, other member countries. And uh, uh, be it TRIO or be it uh, beyond TRIO, uh, we, we value this platform as, um, as a mechanism uh, to develop this relationship. Uh, so what, uh, what we can do uh, uh, at this point of time, how we can use uh, the... Uh, the good offices of the Eastern Partnership Initiative, what, uh, what can be done? Uh, since uh, EU cannot uh, implement any projects with uh, official, uh, with official uh, means, with the regime of Lukashenko, uh, we, we think that this is a good moment for us uh, to, to step in and uh, uh, to redirect uh, the attention, the energy, the resources of, uh, of Eastern Partnership uh, and engage uh, with the civil society. Uh, so the idea is to, uh, as much as possible, uh, help Belarus prepare for the transformation, for the transition uh, from the authoritarian and dictatorial regime of Lukashenko to a democratic um, model of governance. Uh, and uh, there are several core initiatives that uh, we would like to, uh, to suggest uh, at this stage. Uh, there, this is something uh, to discuss and we also value your opinion, your feedback on what, uh, what directions, uh, what projects uh, could be implemented at this stage. So uh, since we, we would like to, uh, to see this democratic change in Belarus as the start of the transformation, this is not just to have elections and, uh, and to have a new leader uh, ruling the country, but it's, it's also about democratic transformation of Belarus. We need to develop uh, modern institutions for the future. Uh, and those uh, uh, for, for rapid change, uh, we need to prepare 
uh, such solutions that would be uh, rapidly implemented. And we can do this today uh, to de develop this uh, model institution. Institutions, uh, for example, uh, to, to launch uh, an education platform, massive education platform, uh, the country would need uh, to have uh, uh, experimental educational institutions and uh, uh, such experience uh, could be uh, developed, refined and then uh, transferred and implemented throughout the entire education system. And uh, uh, we, can, we can say that today's Belarus requires uh, such reforms across the board, like essentially every Every area of governance, every facet of life of Belarusians uh, has uh, has been backwards uh, compared to our um, to our partner nations, to our neighbors. Uh, the country needs such reforms badly uh, in every sector of uh, of governance and life. Uh, we also need to. Uh, uh, to pay attention to, to the education professional uh, retraining of specialists, uh, since reforms are, would, are not possible uh, without people who will be able to implement them. Uh, and this requires targeted training, uh, which of course cannot be replaced by short-term educational courses or scholarship uh, support. Uh, and the, the problem of, uh, of fellowship programs is that they're scattered and uh, not always allow the uh, accumulation of uh, human resources uh, in targeted area. Again, uh, just like with the, with the previous area, uh, uh, developing model reforms for Belarus, uh, these trainings of specialists uh, uh, is required essentially across the board, uh, be it business, uh, be it green economy, education, culture, foreign affairs, you name it. Uh, so the needs are significant uh, in this regard. Uh, civil society uh, is something that's uh, uh, very important for us at this point of time, since uh, it, is, it is going to be civil society who will own the reforms, who will own the development of, uh, of these reforms. And we already have a number of initiatives uh, who develop the, uh, who collect the ideas uh, and develop them from scratch uh, into frameworks, into more detailed uh, understanding how uh, how national interest will be uh, reflected in these uh, reforms and how they will be developed into actual policies. Finally, we need to have a strong, robust uh, media program uh, to support uh, independent media uh, in, um, uh, in Belarus and for Belarusians uh, to, to educate, to inform and to be a platform for discussion, like what actually the uh, the national interests of Belarus are, uh, what are the needs uh, for reforms and what could be the policy options uh, for Belarusians. You might know that uh, uh, by now, uh, essentially, all independent media in Belarus has been wiped out uh, by the actions of, uh, of Lukashenko. Uh, media either would have to go uh, underground uh, or uh, media has, has been forced to relocate to neighboring countries. Uh, to Ukraine, to Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, and Georgia. Uh, and uh, uh, this, uh, this has created a new environment uh, uh, for media that has just a year ago been uh, absolutely successful and vibrant and uh, self-reliant. Uh, self uh, now they have to uh, now they have to seek resources uh, to continue their work, and we understand that uh, not not providing such assistance would leave a void uh, in this uh, public sphere that could be filled by low quality product uh, propaganda, disinformation, and and we know there are actors out there who are wi willing to to fill the void. Uh, now going uh, to the issue of, um, uh, of the summit, uh, Eastern Partnership Summit, uh, unfortunately, uh, Belarusian Democratic Forces uh, uh, will not have a chance to be present at the summit. Uh, initially, there was an idea of having an empty chair. Uh, there was a concept that uh, Lukashenko will not be uh, invited, uh, but neither would be Democratic Forces. Uh, we disputed this idea uh, since it would be playing more in favor of Lukashenko, who wouldn't be invited there anyway. And essentially, it's a recognition uh, that the suspension uh, of Belarus pa uh, participation in the Eastern Partnership Initiative uh, actually is a legitimate one. And we dispute that. Lukashenko doesn't have the right uh, to, to make decisions that affect interests of uh, Belarusian people on such a scale. Uh, so not having Belarus there uh, actually plays into the uh, into favor of uh, of Lukashenko. Uh, instead, we were suggested that there could be a side event uh, uh, during the summit, uh, sort of adjacent to the summit itself, and unfortunately, it didn't work out either. Uh, instead, we will be 
uh, having a dedicated meeting with the High Commissioner Borrell and uh, possibly with the participation of President Michel uh, and several ministers of foreign affairs uh, participating in the uh, in the events. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, before the uh, previous Foreign Affairs Council uh, in November, we submitted uh, to the ministers of foreign affairs of the European Union our suggestions on uh, on the positions on Belarus that could be reflected uh, in the uh, in the summit declaration uh, and um, uh, one of them uh, I will I will briefly uh, mention them uh, the suspension of Belarus participation in the Eastern Partnership Program by the illegitimate Lukashenko regime is rejected by the Belarusian people by the EU and its member states. Uh, cooperation with Belarus will continue uh, in the Eastern Partnership Framework through the Belarusian society. The EU will proceed with the implementation of the flagship projects uh, with the participation of the civil societies that need to be, uh, even though if they're based abroad, uh, they will be directly engaged in the activities uh, related to the implementation of these projects uh, to the maximum possible ability now. Uh, the EU will maintain the achieved level of agreements on simplifying the visa regime for Belarusian citizens, uh, keep open the opportunities for civil society participation through the civil society forum, and will develop programs to support independent media, civil society organizations, and private businesses. And finally, uh, the fundamental conditions for the resumption of the dialogue with the official Belarusian authorities within the Eastern Partnership Framework are as follows. Release all political prisoners, cease violence and repression, <laughs> and conduct free and fair elections under international observations. Uh, so uh, this is what what our position. This is what our asks for the final declaration uh, of the summit. Um, of course, we have we have no control over what uh, what are the discussions uh, around the declaration. Uh, we uh, we are only hopeful uh, that these messages have been heard uh, by the ministers of foreign affairs of the European Union and that participating states also will will support the aspiration of Belarusian people uh, to be uh, to be present, to be a full-fledged partner of the Eastern Partnership at this uh, rather dramatic and crucial stage for Belarusian history. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, last but not least, we are also very pleased to have with us Shahla Ismail, who is a national facilitator for Azerbaijan in the Eastern Partnership Civil Society Forum. And she's also chairwoman of the Women's Association for Rational Development in Azerbaijan. I will hand over to Shahla now for her remarks uh, and want to highlight here something that, uh, that was mentioned earlier, this issue of the deepening diversification uh, among the Eastern partnership countries and how we can bridge that and how we can bring all um, six Eastern partnership countries closer uh, to the values um, that, that the partnership is, uh, is promoting. Uh, perhaps this is one, uh, one issue particularly relevant in, in also in Azerbaijan's context. Shahla, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Warm greetings from Baku. And I'm very happy and, and uh, honored to share this panel with these distinguished speakers. And I'm very sorry um, that um, there is no representative of my government being present here, which would indicate probably more commitment to the Eastern Partnership uh, Summit and you know all, all the commitments we are talking about. Uh, yet, I think that uh, I'll be able to, to map out out, um, to outline some of the key points, which should definitely be uh, they are taken on the on the table during the Eastern Partnership uh, Summit, but also afterwards. Uh, so, what, first of all, thank you very much, Iskra, for this very interesting question regarding the uh, diversification and how to make these six uh, countries closer to to each other and to Eastern Partnership values. The thing is that definitely it sounds very good on wording, but in reality, what we see is that uh, six countries all have completely different challenges and completely different, uh, you know, attitudes toward these challenges. And uh, with that to say, uh, of course, we have also a lot of common uh, problems as well, which can be and should be tackled. No, no, no. Could, uh, could everyone mute, please, who is not speaking? Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, so 
Um, of course, we have also a lot of similarities and these common issues should be tackled uh, with one approach. But in general, taking into account the different levels of commitments, different levels of attitudes and the dosages of courage to undertake certain commitments, uh, we, of course, uh, should not, not apply the methodology which would embrace the one fit all approach. So with that to say, we should diversify, diversify our attitudes uh, toward each of six countries and should definitely take into account the specific challenges within the countries as well as the specific opportunities uh, within every country for different stakeholders. With that to say, for Azerbaijan, I would like to emphasize that out of these 12 years of Eastern partnership, as, as a phenomenon on itself, a political phenomenon on itself. Out of these 12 years, it has been eight years that the civil society of Azerbaijan cannot take an equal part in all the process related to that. Why? Because in 2014, we had unprecedented crackdown on the civil society, which started with change of the legislation, putting completely unfavorable legal environment for the registration, operation, and funding of local organizations in the country. And not just uh, organizations, but also the donor institutions. So basically in 2014-15, more than 50, 50 international organizations also with non-political agendas like Oxfam, like Save the children, world vision, they had to leave the country. And nothing changed ever since. So eight years passed, we are still talking on the same things. We use every opportunity to repeat as a mantra the importance of engagement of the civil society, but whether it is uh, we managed to do anything within the eight years, last years, no, unfortunately, no. And with that to say, uh, since all the strategies, uh, they are reinforcing the role of the civil society per se, uh, again, uh, taking into account this um, in environment in the country, I would draw your attention yet another time um, to reinforce this issue, the importance of this issue, are the Eastern Partnership, uh, some met ahead. Uh, that without the civil society, vibrant, resilient, and you know, capable, we would not be able to outreach the minimum of our goals. What else can I say? Um, and by, by the civil society, just to, to put a dot in this issue, I would also like to draw attention, it's not just the operational environment per se, it's also the capacity of the civil society, which has significantly been weakened in the last eight years. And it's the potential, the, the civil society spirit, which definitely should be invested afterwards uh, for years. And I think that... Uh, EU in general, but EUDs uh, at local levels uh, are having extremely important roles. But these roles can be of two extremes. It could be driving role or driven role. Which one to take? That's up to the probably decision makers in EU at all the levels. Which role to take? Whether they indeed want to be a driving force for making the sufficient support and visible and tangible support to the civil society, because the part of the visibility is also important. It's part of the acknowledgement of the civil society as an equal partner, uh, or to be driven uh, by the. Uh, other priorities, including the, the interest, in, you know, interest in energy, interest in transport, and many other things, which unfortunately sometimes are more dominant than the human rights agenda. So I'm very happy for this panel to take place, not just in, in ahead of the summit per se, although it is dedicated to the summit, but also ahead of the International Human Rights Day. Um, in two days, we will all celebrate that day. And unfortunately, in all our countries, we are having the do you know hundreds of thousands of human rights violations every day? And again, whether the governments are willing first and capable second uh, to be addressing them, big question mark. Especially in the times of COVID and post COVID, uh, whether they would be able to address all those issues and consequences without the engagement of the civil society, I hardly doubt. Um, and another thing is that some of our specific countries are having additional challenges, like, for example, uh, COVID and post-COVID situation is common for all, but uh, let's say post-conflict post or post-war situation, although this post-world post, I can hardly put it as very uh, rigidly because not in none of the contexts we are having indeed the 
post-war or post-COVID yet since it's a lot of question marks are around the issue. But if we are somehow to call this as a post-war, then there are so many issues at all the levels need, uh, which are in need to be solved or at least addressed. And that's the issue of, of peace, the issue of rehabilitation, the issue of security, the issue of human rights. Uh, this is why it's in, very important to put on the table as again strictly as possible, not at the with the verdict of, you know, sharing the concern or you know, it should not be sounding like the concern anymore. If we were ten years ago at that stage, it should be put as a strict commitment, and you now do response for these commitments, whether or not the governments are ready to undertake certain commitments to address the issues at the level of rule of law, good governance. Um, you know, economic reforms, etc., at the level of security. Um, and when it comes to Azerbaijan, of course, uh, this con conditionality should be even stricter because, unfortunately, again, uh, the period of all this, um, um, you know, incapacity, I would say, or unwillingness to address this issue with the civil society, it continues for more than eight years. And for your information, OGP, uh, the, the status of Azerbaijan at Open Government Partnership, at OGP, um, Unfortunately, we are still at the uh, for three years at the silent member status, and there will be the consideration of the status of Azerbaijan in January next year by the steering committee of OJP. And most probably, unfortunately, we will be withdrawn, uh, not withdrawn, but we will be. Uh, we will lose this membership status at all just because of this commitment towards the civil society space was not respected by the government of Azerbaijan. So I think that's a very good momentum now during this partnership summit uh, to, to put on the, table, uh, on the table as strictly as possible all these issues in relation to human rights, to civil society space, but also, you know, in regards also to operational space for independent media, which is yet another angle we can look at the things, but since I represent the civil society, I uh, put more emphasis on that. I think that's very important to put it on the table and to finalize the strategic partnership agreement, as which which the process of which was started with Azerbaijan in 2017, to finalize that agreement as soon as possible, because that will give a new hopefully very uh, strict envelope for the cooperation modalities, which would also stipulate the relationship of EU and Azerbaijan when it comes to hardcore issues on uh, human rights and democratization and other important uh, topics. So with that to say, I would like to again, thank you first of all for this opportunity to, to allow us to voice out our main concern, but also would call um, you or the, the, the decision makers at the European level to uh, put on the table the hardcore issues with not concern language but rather with action language as much as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and we are uh, really uh, ahead of time now so we have to manage the rest of the time very carefully. We have a number of questions that have come through the chat uh, on security, on governance issues, and I do want to come back to them. But before that, I'd like to give the word to uh, several members of the European Parliament who have uh, who have joined us for short comments and reactions. Uh, if you could keep them to three minutes, please. Uh, and we will start with Ms. Anna Fotiga. Thank you very much indeed, Iskra, for giving me the floor. I, I welcome all distinguished uh, uh, speakers. Uh, let me start with the really very good news, uh, and, and that is, from my point of view, participation of Belarusian opposition in, in the Eastern Partnership Summit. It was a long-standing request uh, from the side of many MEPs who, who are engaged uh, in the issue. Uh, summit uh, takes place in extremely 
difficult time, difficult for a whole region in particular by, by mounting military pressure on, on Ukraine. We are fully aware of this, but also on, on the continuing borderization in, in Georgia in, and, and also due to, to Kremlin's um, uh, policies uh, with the subordinated uh, Lukashenko regime, we have uh, already pressures on the UN NATO member states like Poland, Lithuania and, and Latvia. Um, uh, I would like to, to, to say that of all countries, Actually, quite unexpectedly, uh, several years ago, we have a very clear situation with Moldova. Of course, uh, enormous uh, difficulties there, but, but we've seen real progress and, and progress for good in, in uh, the situation of Moldova. So that is the lantern, I would say, and, and the, the uh, light in tunnel for all Eastern partnership countries that actually changes are, are possible. I would like to, to mention one thing that is common, probably not for to all Eastern partnership countries, but Example of Moldova shows that eradication of uh, uh, extreme still existing oligarchy systems in, in uh, uh, the countries, Eastern partnership countries, uh, works to the benefit or, uh, uh, or at least, uh, uh, if not eradication, simply diminishing the role. I would like to mention Georgia here clearly and not uh, shading away from, from this aspect. Uh, surely I remember our talks several, several uh, years ago and, and, and clearly without Plachotniuk, uh, Moldova was able to develop, to, to increase cooperation with the, the EU and, and starting to be transatlantic, credible transatlantic partner, much closer to all of us. Generally speaking, I would like just to mention um, once more Georgia, and I hope that uh, uh, the treatment of former president Mikhail Saakashvili, after some changes, I, I think due also to, to the EU pressure on, on the government that we see already uh, physical participation in, in court proceedings and, and uh, changes of the venue of, of, of his uh, detention was improvement. I hope that not only for the uh, case of Eastern Partnership Summit, that it is to be continued. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and next on my list in order of uh, joining the discussion is uh, member of the European Parliament, Dragos Todorace, please. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for the invitation and, and uh, congrats in a way to everyone that intervened. I, I saw, uh, I think the second part of the uh, conversation with the EAP representatives. Um, I would, Maybe start from where uh, also my colleague um, started, which is the importance of the summit. Um, I think that something that maybe was not evident to everyone a couple of months ago uh, is now uh, evident to everyone, which is uh, that this summit is important not only for the EAP, but it's also very important for the EU. It certainly with what's going on in Ukraine, uh, but also with, with what has been going on uh, in, in uh, Belarus and, and certainly maybe to, to a lesser extent, but, but also uh, evolutions in Georgia are really increasing the, the geopolitical relevance of the summit. Um, 
And we can only hope that the governments of all member states on the EU side will, will feel the same way and be prepared to treat the summit as such. Um, maybe a few words also, uh, again, picking up on where my colleague left it uh, with regard to the country that I know best in, in a way in the, in the EAP fold, which is Moldova, which I cover as, a, as the second. I think we're having a connectivity issue with uh, Mr. Tudorace. Perhaps, perhaps we can we can take a moment actually because two of our speakers will uh, leave us in a few minutes. So I wanted to give them an opportunity for a few final remarks, and then we will come back to our NEP speakers in a moment. Um, let me just uh, let me just uh, go to the uh, hello? Head of the Ukraine. hello hi can you can you see me and hear me yes yes we do hear uh, you now uh, apologies I was in the Wi-Fi of Parliament which no one should trust. <laughs> Uh, not even holding a, a conversation. Um, I think I got interrupted where I was starting with, with Moldova uh, and a few references to, to, to Moldova um, as, as, as I understand the rapporteur for Moldova in, in Parliament. I, of course, I couldn't agree more with, with what my colleague was saying that indeed Moldova has now uh, become a, a beacon of, of hope, uh, an example of, in fact, uh, what societies uh, can, can do uh, if they are truly aligned for the uh, objectives and the, and the desire to, to, um, to get closer to Europe. Uh, but I think uh, if we look at the situation in Moldova right now, certainly with what has happened with the energy crisis, um, it also, Moldova serves as an example of what we as the, as the Union have to do for the EAP countries, uh, because it does bring about the duty uh, of care uh, that we as the EU uh, have, to, uh, have to be aware of. Um, we, we cannot afford not to give full support, not only political, not only rhetorical, um, to Moldova if you really want the Moldovan authorities, uh, the majority in parliament, the president, the government, to basically deliver to the to the Moldovan citizens um, and therefore make the effort that they made as a society worthwhile. Um, and uh, that's something that we also need to deliver at the summit. Uh, somehow um, this political message uh, of, of uh, convergence needs to be there, uh, packed inside the statement of the summit, uh, because uh, governments, not only the Moldovan governments, governments in, in EAP, those that actually uh, remain true to their objectives and to the European aspirations they need uh, to, to feel that we are reciprocating at a particular level uh, with the right level of commitment. So uh, that's the spirit with which uh, I think we, uh, we need to go into the preparations of the, of the, of the summit. It's only a couple of days uh, before, before that. And one last uh, thing, uh, I also very much uh, salute the presence uh, at the summit of the Belarusian um, true representatives um, and um, and I trust that also with you there uh, again the summit will also be uh, able to deliver the right messages for the Belarusian people. Uh, thank you very much for, for the invitation. Thank you very much uh, and as I mentioned since two of our speakers will need to leave uh, at two o'clock uh, I'd like to give them the floor for just one minute each of remarks and we've actually received also a question for the uh, Ukrainian ambassador, Mr. Chentsov. Um, the question is specifically on the added value of the Eastern partnership when there is already an advanced bilateral agenda between the EU and Ukraine. And in this context, also the role of the TRIO format, which could advance uh, outside of the Eastern partnership umbrella. What are the concrete instruments that the Eastern partnership in this case the, um, add value 
to the Ukraine-EU uh, partnership. And this is from Irina Solonenko uh, at Libmod in Germany. We've also received a number of questions on security in Ukraine and specifically the scope and possibility for a CSDP mission. Uh, there were a number of comments uh, on Moldova, also from the two members of the European Parliament. So I will let uh, Christina address those directly. So we'll start with uh, Mr. Chensov and then go to Christina Gerasimo. Ambassador Chensov, can you hear us? I think... I think both Ambassador Chensov and Ms. Gerasimov are no longer on the line. Uh, so unfortunately, we won't have the opportunity to have these questions answered. Uh, but uh, we will welcome any comments from the members of the European Parliament on these two issues. Uh, and with that, I will invite Mr. Kubilius, who has also just joined us, uh, to, uh, to intervene on these issues, but also just uh, as a recap uh, on the issue of good governance and rule of law, which we've also taken some time to discuss and how to deepen reforms in this area, as well as more broadly in what concrete terms the EU could uh, contribute to specific deliverables in, in, in various sectoral areas, such as connectivity, energy, the green transition, uh, and any specific deliverables for citizens of the Eastern Partnership countries um, following previous successful projects such as visa liberalization. Mr. Kubilius, over to you. Well, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, really very broad questions, and I am not so sure that <laughs> I will manage to cover all of them during three minutes, you know, uh, time allocated. But in a very brief way, I would say what really I expect from Eastern Partnership Summit and what we expect in Euronest, uh, you know, Parliamentary Assembly. Since recently we made our, uh, uh, first of all, good, good, you know, uh, discussion in, in Euronest, you know, uh, delegation to Euronest in European Parliament, you know, uh, and where we discussed uh, how EU institutions are implementing last year European Parliament report, which really was very important on Eastern Partnership future. And we concluded that unfortunately, besides all the deliverables, very practical things, which really are important and which Commission is speaking about, there is lack of some kind of more clear, uh, what I would call geopolitical vision. What is next uh, in Eastern Partnership agenda if we are looking into the whole next decade? And that is where I see really uh, that we need to put some joint efforts, both from Eastern Partnership countries and from European Parliament, you know, not to forget that there are two sides of, of you know, story. We are, in European Parliament, we are very good in, in explaining to Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, or Armenia, or Azerbaijan, what they need to do, what kind of reforms they need to do, you know, and really uh, there are things which need to be done but uh, it's really lack of uh, you know more deep uh, uh, views and more deep you know ideas on what is needed to be done on European uh, on EU side on EU institution side uh, because what we are facing that uh, uh, besides all those you know technical issues really the whole debate about integration about the future of integration is for last uh, almost you know decade is in some way in some way is stagnating and that brings some uh, not very positive results uh, trust and belief in integration process is diminishing in all eastern partnership countries motivation for reforms because of that is also diminishing polarization of political life is increasing and we are facing really you know um, in some way, uh, quite big troubles, because that is really not what you should uh, wish to see. And that is opening the doors for some kind of uh, set country interferences. So what we uh, were trying to do during the last several years in, in uh, Euronest, in, in all our discussions, both formal and informal, we were trying to push EU to have more ambitious integration agenda knowing you know very clearly the limits what you know is impossible to expect and what is possible to expect 
And that's why in 2018, we were among the first uh, you know, institutions which proposed uh, TRIO format as uh, something inside of you know, Eastern Partnership policy to have some kind of special attitude from EU towards three of most advanced countries, Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova. And I am very happy that this format is, is becoming a you know, uh, real living format. And I hope that during Eastern Partnership Summit in, 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 the, in the declaration, here will be some, some kind of uh, uh, language uh, which would really welcome that format as, as really very much needed because we see that uh, EU institutions like uh, Charles Michel, as you know, are, are really starting to understand the importance of that format. Now, uh, again, you know, seeing uh, in a very clear way the limits of possibility during the next decade, what is possible to achieve and what is not possible to achieve in integration, we need to see in a very clear way that uh, full membership in our perspective is still for time being, perhaps it's not possible because uh, several big capitals really have clear argument that, you know, without internal reforms inside of you, without uh, reforms of decision making, which is really, you know, quite, quite a difficult uh, uh, job to, uh, to, to achieve decisions in, in the EU, which has 27 members, which when each member has, you know, uh, its veto out. Uh, so I can understand also, you know, uh, Objections from big capitals like Paris and so on that without reforms inside of EU, you know, uh, next state, next uh, enlargement with full membership of such countries like uh, Western Balkans or, or you know, or Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova is uh, is not very realistic. We started to propose what was you know proposed by uh, by European Parliament uh, report, which was led by Petar Sostrevich. You know, last year uh, to focus on integration to single market, you know, to to focus on integration on economical integration into single market into four freedoms, so we can call it you know, European economic area. That would mean you know, implementation of seventy percent of a key. That would mean rule of law uh, system established. That would mean maturity of democracy, and other you know things which are important for for functioning in in single market. That is what was done by Nordic countries back in 1990. And as we remember, after they joined the uh, European Economic Area, after that, they jumped also, majority of them jumped for full membership. Norway decided to stay in uh, you know, uh, European Economic Area. So this is what could bring some kind of new motivation, you know, uh, and realistic motivation, you know, with clear, clear paths for implementation, for achieving that goal both for, you know, Eastern Partnership countries and especially for TRIO, but also, you know, for Armenia, which is not far away from TRIO. Uh, I don't know how Azerbaijan will decide, you know, that depends on them. And I hope that, you know, when democracy will be established in Belarus, uh, they will be able to jump also, you know, for some kind of this very clear perspective, achievable perspective, you know, perspective which, is, which we can trust on both sides. And that is what Eastern Partnership really is very much... Uh, uh, needs and, and why Eastern Partnership really is a policy which could become a most important geopolitical policy of EU for the next decade. Because what is happening in the eastern part of the European continent, that is really where EU should concentrate its all, all geopolitical soft power. EU is not so good in, in that power, but EU can be very effective with its you know, soft power. And we need to convince EU to be more brave to use that soft power in a most effective way. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, and thank you for for these words of, of inspiration as well of how the Eastern Partnership could become a more a stronger EU foreign policy tool and how to bring some of the much needed motivation. Uh, thank you. And now I'd like to go back to our uh, speakers from the six Eastern Partnership countries for a few final remarks, having listened to the inputs, and then we will turn to Mr. Ostrevicius uh, to uh, to try to bring together uh, the richness of today's discussion uh, and maybe leave us with a few conclusions. First, I'll give the words to uh, Valery Kavalevsky. Uh, thank you. Uh, once again, thank you so much for organizing this discussion. It's been long awaited. It's very timely. It's super relevant. Uh, there are many questions uh, uh, raised. Uh, not, not all questions have been answered, uh, but um, 
I certainly hope that uh, during the summit there will be place and space and energy to discuss uh, the role and place of Belarus uh, in this initiative. Uh, we definitely would like to be part of this discussion, but not probably this time. Um, as uh, as soon as Belarus turns democratic, uh, Eastern Partnership Initiative will be uh, an important place. Uh, will will have an important place in our foreign policy uh, of of New Belarus. Uh, but uh, we all wish you a successful uh, summit. Uh, it's uh, it's long overdue, and um, I hope that the summit declaration will will satisfy interests of all participants. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll go in reverse order to Shahla Ismail. Thank you very much. Um, I would also like to reinforce the message of the importance of human rights, which should be one of the main issues absolutely uncompromised. So no matter how many compromises are there, and compromise is a very good issue, but human rights and the space for the human rights should never be compromised. I also have very big expectations regarding the results of this summit and wish good luck to everyone uh, and hope that next year these time we will be talking of slightly different issues uh, but not stick to the same thing and it will not uh, you know repeat the same challenges thank you very much for this opportunity thank you very much and now mr david Bujashvili, please i think you need to unmute could you please unmute We can, you hear me? can you hear yes, me? Yes, we can. Yes. Ah, yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having us and for organizing this very interesting debate, uh, very interesting visions, ideas has been tested. And uh, I think that uh, for the summit, uh, everyone, each Eastern Partnership country, expectations will be played up and uh, it, will be, it will deliver, it will come up with concrete results, concrete deliverables, which will be acceptable for everyone. Um, that's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you. And I think with that, we have all of our speakers who were able to stay uh, until the end. So I would now like to invite Mr. Uh, Mr. Ostrovicius, our host uh, for today, to wrap up the discussion uh, and perhaps attempt to give us a few conclusions of what we've heard today. Mr. Strivicius. Thank you, Iskra. Uh, I will, thank you. You hear me? Do you? Good. Uh, I will try to respond to one question concerning the civilian CSDP mission to Ukraine. And uh, I think it's, it's not too much to speak about uh, the necessity and need to have uh, something more, more EU, EU civilian and, C and uh, CSDP roof uh, present in Ukraine. And there are possibilities. I will quote only some from the lines of uh, uh, regulations uh, um, from the EU uh, um, uh, rules. For example, respond to crisis situation. And we do have a crisis situation in, in not in Ukraine, but because of the uh, Russian uh, troops concentration on, on the border. We, we might have uh, need to build more um, capacity for partner country like Ukraine. Yes, indeed. And for example, uh, fields of this uh, civilian CSDP mission might be different, like policing. So why not? I mean, why not to increase this uh, s uh, s uh, security sense on, uh, among the civilian population, especially uh, coming to the border regions and so on and so forth. Uh, we will try to do our best and initiate uh, those things uh, on our side because I don't think that uh, we, we, we have a privilege, I mean, of waiting. No, we don't have this privilege. And I thank you all uh, participants of this uh, two hours exchange, but you, you can't galoop uh, through such a vast region of uh, Eastern Europe in two hours. I mean, through the all political uh, agenda issues and so on. But three points from my side. Let's be politically ambitious, and we have to be because we're speaking about the future of our countries, of our nations, of uh, uh, possibilities of individuals, and this is so important. I mean, let's be ambitious. Secondly, let's be timely responsive towards the needs which occur sometimes, like pandemia, 
like uh, the security situation now in, uh, uh, on the Ukraine's border and so on and so forth. And let's be practical because all our talks, all our agreements and papers we produce and strategies we prepare have to lead us to some practical change because our people need this. I mean, they can't uh, wait for decades and decades for some change. So with this in mind, I expect from the, um, the Eastern Partnership Summit uh, a, a further commitment, strategically based, uh, and be sure, I mean, from the e European Parliament side, uh, we always be um, uh, very ambitious and will ask more than it's written in papers because this is our destiny and this is our job. So that's why I thank you all participants, uh, all uh, who listened to our um, exchange and uh, presented questions and comments. And I thank you, organizers. Iskra, thank you very much for very dedicated uh, moderation uh, of this session. I thank you, Davila, for making uh, uh, an agenda ready and inviting all participants. And I thank you, uh, Andrews, for technical uh, backup uh, of uh, our debate. Thank you all. I'm looking forward for our continuous engagement and uh, uh, success of uh, our common enterprise. Thank you very much, Petras. Thank you from my side as well for the invitation, for having organized this. Thank you to all the speakers. Uh, I hope our audience will join me in thanking them by posting many likes on Facebook and many comments uh, under, these, uh, under the streaming of the event. And we now just have to wait and see for the Eastern Partnership Summit next week. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye.